No, and then they'll even be like, oh, I'm so sorry, ah, so sorry, or like, ah, you, 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 within the Cantonese community in SF. However, it's mostly because it fits into this larger narrative globally of like, is Cantonese a dying dialect? And is everybody who's speaking Cantonese right now in one or two generations just gonna be speaking Mandarin? Some yeah. people are freaking out. Yeah, all right, everybody. We're gonna talk about, go through the comments section. Uh, please hit that like button. Check out other episodes of the Hot Pop Boys as we go through it. Obviously guys, San Francisco, of the big cities in America, it is the Cantonese stronghold. It has over 10,000 limited English proficient residents there, people who essentially are not as good as English, but better at Cantonese. Also, Cantonese is the most commonly spoken language by the city's Chinese population. So uh, yes, if the city college is scaling back one of its, the 16 course, uh, Cantonese certification, it obviously means something. There still is a nine unit course one, but the 16 one's gone for now. The 16 one was the one that I wanted to take. Yeah. Well, I wanted to teach. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, and and obviously guys, we, uh, our, our father is from Hong Kong, so we are half Cantonese, half Mandarin, if you want to say that, even though those are not ethnic groups, they're, they're language groups. Right, right, right. Uh, because even though it's sort of people think that Cantonese is a ethnic group and Mandarin's not, but even Cantonese is actually more used as a lingua franca in that region. Because yeah. you could be Hakka, you could be Chiljiao, you could be Shanghainese that fled after the war to Hong Kong and became Hong Kongized, but you're not actually Canto. So it's actually super complicated. But anyway, that stuff is for a way another video. Andrew, let us get into the comments section mm. and then get into our own takeaways. And I, what I do want to say before we get in the comments section is that there is actually some disagreement about whether Cantonese is dying. Some people are like, eh, it's okay, it's still in a good place. And then some people are like, no. Anyway, let's get into the comment section. Somebody said 80 million people speak Cantonese worldwide and it is still a top 20 most spoken language in the world. Why is everybody freaking out? And then somebody said, yeah, that's true, but a language's stability is measured by more how many of its speakers are passing it on to the next generation. And that, I could imagine, is the one shrinking rapidly for Cantonese. Both of these, Andrew, competing facts, both true. Yeah, so I do think Obviously, there are a ton of people who still can speak Cantonese across the globe, mm. but uh, possibly they're older and possibly the proficiency is going down the younger you are. And that does that mean the next generation, like even our generation, like the 25, 30 year olds, are we going to pass it down to our kids? That is the big question. So my question for everybody watching, if you are a Cantonese speaker, how do you plan on passing it down? Yeah, I mean, it has to do with almost like the life you live. If you're mostly talking to family members or if you're looking for something to communicate with the globe, realistically, Andrew, it's almost like the whole earth is either just going to be like English, Spanish, or Mandarin, right? Yeah, no. It, like, it like, like, if we're really going to boil it down. I mean, I will say also, though, that you could almost say this about any language that is not Spanish, Mandarin, or English. Like Italian, like more people are not learning Italian. Right. Italian is not growing because even the younger generation of Italians, they are using a little bit more and more English words in their speech. Actually, Italy, Andrew, implemented some very strong reforms rec recently to try to fight off the influence of the English language amongst the Italian youth. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I think Arabic might be coming in in there as well. Somebody said, Cantonese by far the best language to swear in. That alone should justify efforts to preserve and spread Cantonese. Guys, if people are not speaking Cantonese, they will be swearing in Cantonese. Ooh, hey man, listen, anything that allows a language to stick around, at least in some part, right? Somebody said Cantonese is also the funnest language you can learn out there. It's got nine tones and it just sounds a lot more colorful and less academic or less bureaucratic when you speak it more than Mandarin. Is it interesting though, David, that the Cantonese English accent is the most popular funny Chinese accent to do? I almost want to argue it's the most funniest just Asian accent, period. Yeah. People love the people love to do the Hong Kong accent, whether it is accurate or inaccurate. They think it's hilarious. Yeah, exactly. So I guess the accent is definitely going to stick around, at least in a co comedic sense, but I don't know if the high level of the 
spoken language is going to be around. Yeah, that. to be honest, I think there's a lot of structural things that you got to take a look at, and I'm sure you could argue this way, that way. Uh, will it be a slow glide down, or will it be a drop-off? Who knows? Somebody said, interesting, but uh, what will these certificates do to benefit the students? I mean, literally, I'm just asking from a practical perspective. This is sort of back to the issue at hand, Andrew. What were people going to do with the two-year degree in the Cantonese language from the City College of San Francisco. Well, I, yeah, I mean, they could go back to maybe Hong Kong and do something, or I guess they could teach, open up a a youth Cantonese school, I guess, you know what I mean? I mean, yeah, I don't know. They could know. go to Penang, Malaysia. They speak it a lot there when I yeah. went to Penang. I mean, I think the truth is, man, when you really look at Cantonese, there's the linguistic and then the academic and the identity aspect. And then there's the practicality because the thing is, it is true that most people globally that can speak Cantonese, even as their favorite language or their first language can also speak Mandarin. Mm. But a lot of people who speak Mandarin cannot speak Cantonese as a secondary language. Well, obviously Mandarin is being pushed uh, as the lingua franca that everybody in China has to speak. And even Hong Kong is starting to feel that too, where less and less kids are speaking high-level Cantonese. And it feels like even something anecdotally, Andrew, as such as the Hong Kong golden age of movies, that's sort of over too. Uh, I know sometimes they in, out of Hong Kong, they're making movies in Mandarin just to make more money and have more access to a global market. Mm. I mean, you get access to uh, Singapore and Taiwan and things like that. Somebody said Cantonese really gets needs to get on the apps, man. It's all about getting Cantonese on Hello China. Chinese Duolingo. They just got it on Mango Languages. There's a lot of like um, upstart sort of individual run IG pages teaching Cantonese right now. Dr. Candice Lin, uh, outcast from the HK. Yeah, and they have to, uh, I mean, essentially, people have to find a use for it, man. They have to feel like Cantonese is useful to their life. Right. You're saying on a daily basis with people potentially in their yeah. old age own age range yeah. or cultural relatability interest sphere. And I think one of the problems is that Hong Kong, which is also known as the epicenter or the hub of Cantonese culture right now, it's also heavily English. So a lot of Hong Kong Cantonese, even amongst a certain class of people, is using a lot of English. Are you talking about Palmate, Happy Valley? Yeah. Yeah, and a lot the, of Happy Valley kids like to speak English with each other. Like, yeah, you're, you're saying that the, the Konglish. Wow, Fung Brothers, a whole Zhongyi rap music, you know. Uh. <laughs> Somebody said, isn't Cantonese mostly just a spoken language? And someone said, yes and no. There is a formal Cantonese, Andrew, when you write it down, that is a lot more similar to standard written Chinese or Mandarin Chinese. Chinese, which is like kind of like how people were able to communicate in China all in the back in the days when the, everybody spoke different dialects. They would write to each other and they would have to know the formal version of their language. But there is a slang colloquial spoken version of language that is very difficult to write out for a Mandarin speaker to understand. Mm -hmm. Andrew, for example, terms like Hailito in Mandarin is Shinitu, which doesn't mean anything. Oh. But Hailito is like right here. Yeah. But so, that would be in Mandarin, I guess the equivalent would be like Tai Tuli. Right, 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 but, which would be completely written complete, in characters differently. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know, man. It's complicated. I mean, somebody say one somebody said one day only overseas Chinese will understand Cantonese, Hokkien, Hakka, or Chiu Chao. Yeah. Di, 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 yeah. I mean, these are all dialects that I mean, especially you're talking about Hokkien and Chiu Chao. Like these are dialects that have been shrinking. Because they even a lot of they their dialects got taken over by Cantonese speakers because Cantonese was kind of the southern dialect, like the lingua franca of the southerners. And some people in SF or like Boston, old school Toy San strongholds, like the older, older generation, they even felt some type of way about leaving Toy San or like Zong San behind and learning Canto. So then it's funny that only now the people who speak Canto, they, it's almost like whatever happened to an even smaller sub dialect that within the Canto umbrella is happening within Cantonese underneath like Dang. southern dialects like Fujianese or whatever. So it's true, like some. People from Zhongshan, which is another, you know, they essentially speak a, like a, a different it's type like of Cantonese. It's 70% different yeah. than Cantonese. But then they're like, oh my gosh, like, then we, our whole family learn Cantonese. And now Cantonese is going away. It's just our languages keep going extinct. <laughs> Somebody said uh, there used to be a lot more material 20 years ago when the British still ruled Hong Kong. But over the past 20 years, there haven't been a lot of new materials. And somebody said all Cantonese learning materials, whether it's for English speakers or Mandarin speakers to learn Canto, always focuses on learning dim sum. There's got to be more than dim sum. Yeah. That's why the swearing aspect comes in, right? Yeah, swearing, dim sum, uh, gossiping. 
Uh, those are definitely the most important. I'll never forget like the dim sum dishes and I will never call dim sum dishes by the Mandarin name. All right. I do not feel comfortable doing that. It's yeah. Weird yeah. to me. Somebody said all man, non Mandarin dialects are pretty much fading more or less some faster and some not as yeah, fast. I mean, right? there's dialects up North, obviously in like you know, Shandong, Dongbei, you know, the way they They are more similar to Mandarin immediately, yeah, I mean, though. it's probably similar to Mandarin, but essentially those accents are going to go out of yeah, style what's the soon. Sandong yin? What's the Sandong yin? Yeah. They're not going to say it like that I mean, in the next generation. Shanghainese, which is essentially kind of feels like a different language, it's it's getting phased out, too, with yeah. the younger generation. I mean, listen, guys, things, they just change. I don't know. I mean, obviously, I some type of... I'm not going to tell anybody that it's like, if you feel some type of way about it and more intensely than other people, I understand where you're coming from, but things always change. But my question is like, how do you maintain culture? How do you maintain pride in it? And how do you maintain usefulness? Pride, usefulness, and appeal. Yeah, it's almost like those the uh, bubbles on the Venn diagram got to all yeah. overlap, right? How, how are you going to keep it relevant to people? This guy said... I wish that people will stop saying that Cantonese is dying because Cantonese people, they are so pragmatic. If you, they hear that Cantonese is dying, then they will not want to teach their kids because so we should say that Cantonese is thriving and then that will convince the Cantonese parents to keep teaching the Saman Zai. Oh, it's a self fulfilling prophecy or yeah. you kind of manifest it. And it has to do honestly with sort of the, the pragmatism of Cantonese yeah, people I guess too, or true. just of any Chinese I mean, people. I guess I would say Cantonese people, if I had to say, they are pretty practical in the sense like they're just going to learn whatever works, like work with whatever type of people, you know, I, I guess. I don't know. They're certainly not fundamentalists mm. uh, is the easiest way to put it. The, whatever the opposite of that is. Somebody said, I grew up speaking Cantonese and then I later learned Mandarin moving on older in my life. I also speak Spanish and French. I would say the Cantonese and Mandarin are about as close as Spanish and French are. Uh, for me, Andrew, uh, obviously our parents are half, half, right? We got, I got exposed to both simultaneously a lot growing up. I'd say it's almost like to me, even closer than that. I'd say it's like Spanish to Portuguese. Oh, whereas like, you know how they say a lot of Portuguese speakers can understand Spanish, but a lot of Spanish speakers cannot understand Portuguese, oh. like organically. Interesting. Um, somebody said any language without a distinct written form is doomed long term. So, I mean, listen, guys, to me, I think you could break it down this way. You could break it down that way. You could bring in linguists. You can bring in just the practical people who are just trying to live a successful life in their daily spheres or whatever that they operate in. I will say this, things always change, you know, from ancient Chinese to middle Chinese. And there was different forms of middle Chinese, which sounded super different. And those all sort of split off into the modern dialects, you know, everything from Cantonese to Chiu to Fujianese to Shanghainese, which is Wu all the way up to Mandarin. And then there's different forms of Mandarin. You know yeah. what I mean? Like things always change, right? Sichuan, Hua. Yeah, I mean, my overall takeaway is that everybody just has to have their reason on why they want to preserve Cantonese as a language. You have to find your real reason. If it's to speak with your grandmother or to go back to Hong Kong, great, you know? And I think Cantonese is going to be around for generations to come. It really is. I don't think it's going away anytime soon. Mm. I do think it is in a constant decline, to be honest. Right. But it's not like shooting down. Like it's not going to get cut off. It's, because, it's like on a glide down. Yeah, and then also like the food is still going to help. But at the end of the day, in this capitalistic world, it's going to follow the money, man. If the money and the flow and the power is with learning Mandarin, they're going to learn Mandarin. Just like Shanghainese within Shanghai. Guys, you're not going to meet that many young Shanghainese people who speak Shanghainese that very well. well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, it's, a, it's a different dialect. So I'm saying like uh, that's there. Everybody's worrying about their dialect going away, you know, and everybody's dialect in a way can go away of the smaller groups, you know? Like, what if you're a smaller Asian group? Def then then you've been known that your then your language gonna is gonna go away. Right, you know? like we had given the previous example of the sub-sub dialects within the Canto umbrella. Oh, yeah. Those have been washed away for maybe even uh, 20, 30 years. I mean, years think how ago. hard it is to continue, like, you know, learning, like, the Hmong language, right? Like, you know, that's just gonna be tough. And then are you gonna learn Hmong green, Hmong blue, Hmong white? Yeah. I mean, there's, like, different sub-sub dialects exactly. even within Hmong, right? Exactly. Anyway, let's get into our takeaways, Andrew. Honestly... I think that YouTube is the best way to keep these alive because you got to take the coolest expressions and make sure that those get popular. Like in New York, they do such a good job of incorporating things, Andrew. Like I know, I don't know a lot of Spanish, but I know a lot of Spanish slang. Ah, tranquilo, tranquilo. Right, right. Uh, I know, I don't know Bangladeshi, but I know Mata because in the rap song, somebody said straight to the Mata. 
and I had to look into it. Mata means head in Bengali. Right. So you know what I'm saying? Like, I guess, do you, do you think that that's a, that's a good path? Like, you know, like things yeah. that are like, even if they go away, they're never forgotten. They're never forgotten. It you, means- the, the Yucatan language, Andrew, the Mayan, the Aztecan language in Mexico, people cannot speak it really, but they still say like nixtamal. Nixtamal is not a Spanish word. Right, right, right. You know what I mean? They still say like different things. Or in uh, Black Panther, he brought it back because Namor was speaking Yucatan. He wasn't speaking Spanish. Yeah, I think my like Cantonese is just is still going to be around. It's still got a couple generations, but there does need to be a concerted effort by some people to keep it going. So don't just switch to Mandarin so quickly or don't like shy away from speaking. People cannot be shy about trying to speak Chinese. You have to continue to try to speak Chinese. Even if you're not that good at it, you have to continue to try would you, or else. Would you use yourself as an example of this? I like to try to speak it. If people are willing to be patient enough and joke around about it with me, let's do it, you know? Is it the most efficient way to learn? Maybe not. It'd probably be more efficient if I went to China or if I went to Hong Kong and just stayed there for six months, you know? But ultimately... You know, do what you can within your life because everybody has to be practical about their life. And uh, I guess at the end of the day, everybody wants to live the best life they can. So if speaking Cantonese makes your life better, it helps you meet the people that you want, helps you connect with the people mm. that you want, then so be it. But if it's if it's not useful to your life at all, then you're just not going to speak it. You know, it's tough to say because I just went to, uh, and we went to Mabu Cafe the other day. And uh, they were playing like old 90s and like 2000s Canto movies. But does that kind of show you that none of the, like the hyper modern Canto movies are that popular if you're always leaning back on like old Stephen Chow do- uh, catalogs? Yeah, man, I'm not going to lie. I try to watch some Cantonese like action movies like of the past like 10 years. They're pretty cringe, man. They're uh, pretty cringe. They, they're, they're not, cringe, they're not I, hitting I like, like they used to, man. I don't know what, if they the, the good guys went to go make stuff in Mandarin. I, would, I did look this up, Andrew. The only language that has ever been revived in world history and had a exponential leap in speakers is Hebrew. And there was a lot of religious things that went into that. Yeah, well, there... There was see, like a concerted like team effort, you know. See, it has a strong need. Uh, you know what I think, Andrew? When I say gone but never forgotten, I'm talking about like 1990s Michael Jordan basketball. If you listen to rap music, they're still referencing Ginobili, you know, Rondo, Jordan, Pippen, but those guys haven't, you know, Jordan and Pippen didn't play in the league for 20 years. Right. So so why is everybody still looking at the 90s? And like, if, if you watch, if you go into any sort of retro bar that's like, cool and hyper contextual in New York. They're always playing like Knicks games or like old Jordan games, you know, and Ame Leon Dore. They're not playing like modern stuff. So it goes to show you, you can make it a classic. David, are you trying to say that Gong Dong Hua ho, ho, hi, ho iconic? Iconic. Hi, ho iconic. Wow, but the Liu. Um, I think it's true, man. Listen. The 90s, it's always going to be the classic NBA generation that is forever etched in a time. But modern day, it's Trey, Dame, and Steph running around Jokic, Shingun, and LeBron, right? All right, everybody, let us know in the comments down below what you think. Is Cantonese going away, actually? And how do you plan on keeping the Cantonese language tradition alive in this new world that is moving away from it a little bit? But... Not going away too fast. So let us know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching. We are the Hot Pop Boys. Or should I say the... What would it be? Da Bean Low Boys. Da Bean Low Tai. Yeah, Da Bean Low Tai. Be, right. uh, I'm going to leave some of my favorite um, Cantonese Instagrams down below if you just want a little little hit, you know, a little nostalgia. Or, or learn, like, keep up with the terms. Until next time, we're the Hot Pop Boys. We out. Peace.